Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone from wherever you're joining. Welcome to the second event of 2024 in the Rhodes Trust Scholars Library series. Uh, each month, this initiative, uh, for those of you who've been here before, you'll know, it allows a Rhodes Scholar to come and talk about their literary works to those directly in the Rhodes community and beyond. Uh, this series was born nearly two years ago now. Um, and since then, it's grown in popularity and we're so thrilled to have so many of you here with us. So thank you for joining. Uh, today, we're incredibly excited to welcome Jennifer Robinson to talk about her book, Silenced Women, Why the Law Fails Women and How to Fight Back. And scholar in residence from New Zealand, Maisie Bentley is here to moderate the conversation today. Maisie's an enrolled barrister and solicitor in New Zealand and has received, received various accolades, including being named Thompson Reuters' top student in contract law, the most inspirational young person of the year, and the Ministry for Youth's outstanding youth champion. After her undergrad studies, Maisie worked for the UN Refugee Agency and then for a law firm working on litigation and international law with a focus on climate change. She's interested in the relationship between law and social issues, and she's currently reading a master's in women, gender and sexuality studies. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Maisie, who will give you a further introduction to Jennifer and the session, and we can get right into it. Please have a think and post any questions you might have uh, in the Q&A section on the bottom of your Zoom as we go, and we'll get through as many of them as we can towards the end of the session. Um, but for now, over to you, Maisie. Thanks very much, Georgie, for that introduction. It's a, a pleasure to be um, here with you all this evening and to be able to chat to Jennifer about her book. Um, before we get into talking about the book, I'll introduce you more fully to Jennifer, who has also studied here at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, also at Balliol College, where I'm currently studying. Um, Jennifer is now a barrister at Doherty Street Chambers with a broad practice across media law, public law, international law, and extradition. She advises on a wide range of media law issues, including defamation, privacy, contempt, freedom of information, national security, and reporting restrictions, and has intervened regularly on behalf of the media in strategic cases before UN bodies, the European Court of Human Rights, and the English courts. Alongside her legal practice, Jennifer has taught at the University of Sydney on the Social Justice Clinical Program, and she's also created the Bertha Justice Initiative, a global program and network to support emerging lawyers into public interest law, providing support and advice to lawyers conducting strategic public law and human rights litigation. And as Georgie alluded to, today we'll be talking to Jen about her book, Silenced Women, why the Law Fails Women and How to Fight Back. The book examines the currently broken system and explores the changes needed in order to ensure that women's freedom and their freedom of speech is no longer threatened by the laws that are supposed to protect them. Thanks so much for joining us, Jen. Great to be here. Thanks for hosting us. So I wanted to start off by asking you about the focus of the book, which is on freedom of speech. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this because when people think about gender-based violence and especially sexual violence and the law, um, their mind naturally turns to the criminal law, which is a very significant and um, an important area of law on the subject. But as, as your book has demonstrated, there's all these other areas of law um, that, that impact on the issue and can positively address the issue or um, perhaps exacerbate it depending on how they're used. Um, so what inspired you to write um, on these kind of other areas of law, like freedom of speech, and why do you think it's important that we do so? Well, I mean, that's a big question, but uh, there were a couple of things that got me interested in this subject and motivated me to write this book with my co-author, uh, my brilliant co-author, Dr. Kena Yoshida, who's a fellow barrister at Dowdy Street Chambers and now working for the Centre for Reproductive Rights. So we were, say, we were kind of... Uh, alarmed by what we were seeing in our legal practices. So both of us work in-house at media organize, had worked in-house uh, at newspapers, helping journalists to break stories and doing the legal review of the newspapers before they went to print. Um, and so we were seeing behind the closed doors, the stories that were being spiked and how these stories in a pre and post Me Too world were being treated. So we were seeing so many of these stories spiked and questions being asked, well, uh, 
how, like there's only one woman making this accusation, so can we really report the story? Um, and asking started asking these questions like how many women does it take to come forward about someone before we can report these stories? Because, of course, you know, there's been big battles in the criminal justice system to ensure that one woman's testimony is enough alone to, to convict someone and send them to prison for crime, uh, gender-based violence crimes that often happen behind closed doors. So why is it harder to print it in the newspaper when we're talking about someone's reputation? Um, and so we were seeing so many of these stories being shut down. Um, and at the same time, um, some of the key uh, defamation cases that were coming through the courts of this country, all of the key uh defamation cases that were going up to the Supreme Court were all about domestic violence. And I was like, this is an interesting phenomena. And at the same time, uh, my grandmother worked in domestic violence refuges in Australia. So I sort of grew up around um, understanding these issues and with kids in refuges who were, had escaped violent homes. And I was sitting at home with my grandmother uh, some Christmases ago, I want to say like seven or eight years ago, and which planted the seed for this work. And, and she was really depressed because the figures had come out about violence in, against women in Australia. And it was one in three have suffered sexual violence, sexual assault, one in four domestic violence. And she was depressed because she'd long retired from the refuge movement. Um, she actually had a nervous breakdown, had to retire because she'd seen one too many women killed. And uh, she said, I'm depressed because the figures aren't getting better. It's the same as it was when I was working in the refuge movement. And I thought, here's my wonderful grandmother who spent her life trying to improve the situation for women who had suffered domestic violence as a survivor herself. And I thought, well, what am I doing about it? And I thought, well, I'm not going to go and retrain and run a refuge, but I'm a free speech lawyer. I can see this problem in the practice that I work in this space that I work in. Um, so I'm going to turn my skills to this issue. And the key point about the book is that we can't grapple with violence against women in our society or even begin to if we can't talk about it. So I actually think the problem is much bigger than the figures which are already alarming. It's the most prolific human rights abuse in the world. It's already alarming, but I think the figures are probably a lot higher because not just because of the cultural taboos about speaking out, but the uh, the legal restrictions that women face. And so I guess what we were saying, um, we, you talked about the criminal law. We've talked about a lot of these issues in the criminal law for a long time, but what we saw in the post Me Too era is suddenly when we were breaking this cultural silence about speaking out, we were seeing this wave of litigation and kickback in the law and that to me was interesting as a phenomena to see. And we so we wanted to write about it, both from the perspective of our cases, what we were seeing in our practice. And a lot of this stuff actually we can't talk about or you can't talk about in detailed terms because a lot of what we advise on is privileged and never sees the public domain. So I can't talk to you about the stories that were spiked. Um, but what I can do and what we can do as lawyers is talk about the general trends that reflect what we're seeing behind closed doors, which is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you see in public. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I think picking up on your theme of, um, you know, thinking about your kind of unique skill set as a, a free speech lawyer and a media lawyer and, and how that played into writing the book, um, for a lot of people, these these concepts of free speech and defamation, especially in, in their kind of technical sense, aren't that accessible and they're often used in these colloquial ways but that are quite detached from their specific legal meanings. And in reality, you know, both in theory and in, and in practice, they can be quite um, legally technical. Um, and obviously one of the aims of your book is to try and make those concepts more accessible, especially to help people understand how they apply in this context. Um, and without kind of asking you to summarise the whole 400-page book in a few sentences, I think it would be helpful for the audience if you could kind of highlight some of those, those main kind of free speech or defamation concepts and and how they they are engaged in this issue of women speaking out about gender-based violence? I'll do my best. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how many lawyers we have on the call, but I'll do, I'll do my best. Uh, so basically free speech is a human right. We have the right to free speech under international law. In, in, in this country, we talk about it in terms of the European Convention of Human Rights and Article 10. Uh, but free speech is not a is not an unlimited right. So we recognise in our society that there are, you can say what you want, but there are certain circumstances where the government can regulate um, and will take a balancing approach to, to your right to free speech. So one of the recognised things, for example, national security. So uh, they could, you can, you balance it. So can I publish anything or can I damage national security? And there's a balancing act. In this context, when we're talking about defamation, it's 
basically we talk about the right to free speech. We also talk about the right to privacy and the protection of reputation, which is also a protected international human right. Uh, and in the European context, Article 8 of the Convention. And so when we're talking about defamation, it's a balance between these rights. So we recognise that um, in this balance between the need to protect people's reputation and people's ability to speak freely, um, we, defamation law fits in that context because it provides a remedy to those who have had their reputation harmed um, and unjustifiably harmed, so to protect their reputation. To protect free speech, though, there's a whole range of def defences that come into uh, defamation. So, of course, we must be able to say what's true. So we recognise that in our society there's a value in being able to speak the truth, um, and indeed it was uh, Alexander Hamilton who... <laughs> who pursued litigation in the United States to uh, demonstrate that truth ought to be a defence to defamation. So we recognise that there's this balance between uh, saying what's true and being able to report in the public interest. So in a defamation context, you've got the truth defence, you've got in the public interest. So perhaps you might get it wrong, but as long as you reasonably believe it was in the public interest, it was on the subject matter of, of something in the public interest, and you took reasonable steps to verify the information, then you will still have a defence in law. And so we have this balancing act. Um, the way it comes up in gender-based violence cases is that it's very clear that if you are going to accuse someone of rape or domestic violence, sexual assault, these are clearly defamatory accusations. The question is then whether it's true or whether what you said was in the public interest. And what we're seeing is in women's lived experience of the way the law works, it, it sounds fine in practice. So you've we, well, well, it's fine because if it's true, then, then you can say it and you're not going to be sued. The problem is women get sued all the time and newspapers get sued all the time for reporting the truth and someone will allege it's not true and you've got to go through an expensive litigation process to be able to prove that truth in a court of law, which is really expensive and for, for many women who speak out to say this person raped me. Um, the cost and the stress, the cost alone is enough for women to self-censor because they cannot afford or will be bankrupted in order to defend their truth in court. And so it's kind of what we talk about in the book is that we have these legal principles which which come to bear in these issues. But actually, um, when you look at the lived experience of the, of the legal system and the way it operates in practice, there are so many reasons why um, women, like what is your what is your right to free speech mean if you can't afford to defend it? In effect, you don't have it. And so that's what we talk about in the book is what it's like for these women and for journalists to go, to be confronted with these legal threats. And it's not just about defamation. So one of the things we talk about in the book is you have other interests, there's free speech, and then you have other interests. So if it's defamation, it's someone, someone else's right to reputation. Um, but we have other interests like the right to be presumed innocent. We have contempt laws, which limit what you can say when someone's facing criminal prosecution. We have privacy laws that protect in this country, if you're accused of a criminal offence but the police haven't charged you yet, you have the right to privacy over the fact of the investigation. And so what we try to show in the book is that there's all these laws that exist that regulate speech in different ways. And what few people understand is once you've experienced gender-based violence, what you can say and who you can say it to um, is regulated um, at every single point. So who you can say it to, when you can say it and how, and there are legal risks at every turn. And that's what we wanted people to understand when we wrote the book, because you could, you're not, you know, I think there's this sort of misunderstanding post me too. Well, you can just post it on Twitter and it's fine. Uh, it's not fine. And I can't tell you how many uh, women come into our office seeking advice after tweeting about or posting on social media about something and are threatened with legal action. It happens all the time and we want more people to understand that. Yeah, I think that that theme of kind of the relationship between what's written on paper and, and lived experiences is, is really central, central to the book and comes through in many ways. I think and another way that is often forgotten about is actually for these women involved in these cases, how whether it's defending legal action or, or bring, having to bring another form of um, legal action to defend themselves um, is often actually a kind of continuation of abuse. And for these women, it may mean that, you know, a male perpetrator has access to their information or their whereabouts or continued contact, you know, through their lawyer. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more about the way you've seen that manifest, particularly in in the way that free speech law plays out in, in practice. For sure. So 
talking about the lived experience of women being sued. So there's all different kinds of, so we saw a massive spike in defamation claims after the Me Too movement. Um, and this was well documented around the world. And, and what we saw in our research, it's not just happening in developed countries and it's not just about celebrities, it's happening at every level of the court system and across jurisdictions, whether it's the common law, um, the civil law system, uh, geography, cultures, race, religion, wherever it is, it's happening. And so I think it's really important to think about it in that context. The experience of women who are being sued, there's different kinds of defamation claims we're seeing, either where the woman's spoken out and she's sued by the per her alleged per perpetrator personally, where the woman is then faces um, all of the, the cost risk of defending the case. Um, they are, so you face potential bankruptcy, the stress of having to defend a case like that. All of the problems that we see in the criminal justice system where, where the state is prosecuting, choosing to prosecute, here you've got a perpetrator who's using a private um, cause of action against a woman. So she, um, he has the power to bring this suit and that gives him power over her. So women experience it as a form of continued abuse because they uh, maintain contact, they threaten their financial security, they have ac court mandated access to their personal medical information in many circumstances, correspondence. And so it's really invasive process. And so that's why people are starting to talk about it in terms of a, continue, a continued form of abuse. So you may have left this violent relationship and then spoken out about it to try and warn some others or to for your own, because you have a right to speak about your life, um, and then to face this kind of litigation. The other kinds of um, suits we're seeing are where they sue the media. So where, where the media reports your story, the media can be sued for having published it. And for the woman, for the women who have spoken out and then the media sued, it takes away their agency. So they're not in the cost, they're not in the cost risk um, because they're not being personally sued, but it requires still requires them to give evidence in court if the newspaper is going to run a truth defense. And all of all of what we talk about, the trauma, the re-traumatization of the criminal justice system happens in the civil system too, because you're being cross-examined by his lawyers about these traumatic ex experiences. And in fact, they're even starting to talk about these defamation claims as a form of DAVO. I don't know if anyone's heard about DAVO, but it's a it's a tactic used by uh, it's a it's a phrase that was pioneered by Dr. Jennifer Freud um, around the way that perpetrators respond to facing allegations of um, sexual violence, which is deflect, attack, reverse victim and offender. And defamation allows that because you might say he raped me, and then he says it's defamatory for you to, to say that about me. So I'm going to sue you and make you the defendant. And so he becomes the claimant in a claim where, so the woman who's made the accusation becomes a defendant and is on the back foot. And so we talk about it being the law being weaponized as a, as a Davo tactic to make her the defendant. And for women who are facing this, it's really, really traumatic. I mean, I've represented women who have been in both situations where they're being, and men actually, um, I represented a, a gay man who was who was sued for making an accusation about one of his friends. So I've represented both those who speak out and are sued personally, and I've also represented uh, worked with newspapers and media organisations who are threatened or sued for having published these stories. And in both instances, for for the person who's spoken out, it's incredibly traumatic. And the one of the problems is is that because we talk about we sort of think about gender-based violence being in the criminal justice system. Many of the protections that we've that have grown up in the in the criminal justice system to protect complainants don't exist in the civil justice system, uh, and we're seeing this play out in defamation cases, uh, certainly in the UK and Australia and the US, but also around the world, where there's not the same understanding and there's somehow this sense of well, it's okay, it's a civil case, so we don't need any of those protections. And actually, when you're dealing with this kind of subject matter and vulnerable witnesses who are giving evidence about the same subject matter, just because it doesn't have criminal consequences doesn't mean it doesn't have the same effect on the complainant who is being cross-examined in court about these, these experiences. So there's a lot happening in the civil courts that I think we ought to be paying more attention to. Absolutely. And I think one of the things you alluded to towards the end of the book, um, which is perhaps a reflection of some of those more empowering practices starting to maybe emerge in um, the civil law context was women um, 
suing men, suing them for defamation um, in the context of saying, well, you know, it's defamatory for you to call me a liar um, and this kind of reverse suit. Um, is that something that you think we'll see more of and is that something that you would regard as one of those kind of empowering practices or do you think there's other things that that we should be focusing on? I think we need to, there's so many things we need to look at. I really like this new trend of women countersuing. And the reason I like it is because one of the problems we identify is that if you're sued for defamation, so if you're a woman speaking out and you're sued and you go through the court process and you win, you aren't compensated for the years of silencing in the process of litigation because the first thing a lawyer will tell you once you're sued is don't repeat this publicly because you're if you're later unsuccessful in this suit, they'll seek aggravated damages because you've been out repeating the, def the defamation over and over again. So women are silenced in the context of this litigation. So you're not compensated for the years that you're silenced while these legal proceedings work their way through the courts. You don't get, you don't always get all your legal fees back. Even if you win in this jurisdiction, at least uh, we have an adverse cost jurisdiction. So you'll get most of your legal fees back, but you, it might not cover all of your legal costs because the courts often Interparties costs are often less than what you actually pay. So you're out of pocket often in legal costs and, and, the, and the trauma and the, and the time and the stress that you go through. So, you know, so the, the, the way forward is I think is to make, start making counterclaims and it is defamatory. So if you speak out about your experience and someone calls you a liar, to be called a liar is defamatory. And so we've seen, um, we've seen, uh, this, this approach being taken, uh, in the case against Trump, for example, uh, President Trump. We've seen it in different jurisdictions around the world. The first case we saw it in actually was in a case in Japan uh, brought by Shiori Ito. Uh, so for those of you who haven't followed the case, she was recognized as one of Time's Women of the Year. She spoke out in Japan in a, in a culture where silence, women are expected to be silent. I mean, this in, in Japan still in cabinet, in cabinet, women who are in cabinet aren't allowed to speak, <laughs> literally uh, do not speak in the cabinet room. And so that's how strong this, this sort of the cultural silence is for Japanese women. And so for her to speak, she was, she says that she was raped by a, a powerful, she's a journalist and she um, met with a powerful editor to discuss work opportunities. And um, she basically, he took advantage of her when she was very drunk and, and she says raped him, raped her. And she went to the police, the police didn't properly investigate it. And so she went out and did a press conference and said, you know, I was raped and the police have not done their job here to properly investigate this. And he sued her for defamation and said she lied. She countersued him and uh, and won. And so the, ju the judge found that, you know, it did in fact happen. Um, so I think that's a really interesting tactic for women who are being accused of lying. But of course, this all depends on having the cultural capital, the financial capital to be able to run these cases. So actually what we need, I think where you've got the ability to fight back, I think that is an interesting strategy that we're seeing in different jurisdictions around the world. But we have to address the core problem, which is women shouldn't be sued in the first place. And as we argue in the book, this shouldn't just be a question of your right to free speech and someone's right to reputation or to be presumed innocent, for example, or the right to privacy. We as women have a right to live free from violence. Um, we also have the right to equality. And these rights need to be considered in the mix of how uh, the courts analyse these judgments and also in the way that we legislate and the rules around these cases so we make arguments about there should be stronger public interest protections for women speaking out so it is as we say a matter of public interest that women should be able to speak about their experience of gender-based violence because of the point I made earlier we can't grapple with gender-based violence in our society if we just can't talk about it and we as women have those who are survivors have the right to tell their personal story and the way the law operates is making that very difficult and is chilling women's ability to do that. So we need to look at the structure of the law to find ways to create stronger, better defences. And we also talk about anti-slap legislation. So um, more cost-efficient ways to have these cases thrown out early so that women don't have to go through the costs and traumatic ex experience of going through the, through the courts because we recognise that this speech is in the public interest and it must be protected. So um, we're having a big debate in this country at the moment about introducing anti-slap laws. For those who don't know that acronym, 
uh, SLAPs are strategic lawsuits against public participation. So anti-SLAP legislation is supposed to protect that. And we say that this wave of litigation against women for speaking out and, you, and journalists and newspapers for, for reporting on it is a form of um, strategic lawsuits against public participation, limiting women's ability to publicly participate in our society um, and limiting government's ability to really understand the extent of this problem. So we say it should be properly protected. But you probably won't be surprised to hear, we write in the book about um, the problem of laws made by men for men. And we are going to get, there is a debate at the moment in British Parliament about anti-slap legislation, which the US, various states in the US have had for many years, uh, they're talking about introducing it here, but it's only going to apply to financial crimes journalism. So it's to deal with these naughty Russian oligarchs who come here and sue our journalists for reporting on their corruption. But we're not going to, to introduce anything just now to protect women's ability to speak about their experience of violence. And um, as Absama Begum has said in Parliament this past week, quoting our book, this is the problem and we need to address it and we need to include women's right to free speech in any anti-slap legislation in this country. Mm. I think um, picking up on that kind of comment of laws made by men for men, um, obviously that's an issue in Parliament with, this, with the anti-slap laws, um, but many of the this kind of law is being constructed and interpreted in the courts, which is obviously what you focus on in your book, looking at these cases. And I'm curious if, especially given you've looked at so many cases, as you say, across time and jurisdictions and, and countries, do you think, um, based on, on that experience and looking at all those cases, that if we had better representation of women on the judiciary, um, but also as cases and, and barristers kind of bringing these cases and representing these women that these cases might be run or decided differently? I do think we have structural problems in the law, uh, both if we look at the, the, we have a chapter in the book about the history of the law and about laws made by men for, uh, made by men for men to reflect men's experience. Uh, and that's why laws have not um, properly reflected our lived experience. And I think that is a structure, an ongoing structural problem. We still don't have equality in parliament. Uh, we still don't have equality in our courts and on the bench or in advocates that are arguing these cases. And I do think it makes a difference. I've seen it make a difference in cases that I've been involved in. And so I think the more women we have, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, the more women, we need women, more women everywhere where all decision, decisions are made. And, and I think it will slowly start to shift and change the law as we have a, a more, a, there's more pers women's perspective brought to the way that we approach the law, both lawmaking and in the way it's interpreted and applied. Um, but I do think, yeah, I think I think it does make a difference, but there's 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 important case law happening around the world. And, and I'll give you an example of where the law, I, where we think the law is going and where I think it can go. So we opened the book with a case called Stocker and Stocker. And that's a case that uh, Kane and I were asked to intervene in on behalf of Liberty, which is a human rights organization in this country. Um, it was a terrible case where a woman went on Facebook and said that her ex-husband had tried to strangle her. And she was, she thought she was writing to her ex-partner's new partner to warn her. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stocker's new, so it was Nicholas Stocker and her Mr. Stocker's new partner was on Facebook. And so she was, they were having an exchange about what he was like. And she said, well, there was that time he tried to strangle me. The police don't take too kindly to seeing red marks around your throat. And he sued her for defamation for having published that on his new partner's wall. So friends and family had seen it. And so the defamatory, so the, the defamatory allegation was that he had tried to strangle her. And he said that that suggested that he was a dangerous man to anyone he, and certainly to anyone he lived with. So she had police evidence of the red marks around her throat, her own testimony explaining how he had forcibly grabbed her around the throat. Um, it went before the courts in this country. She had evidence from the police who saw the red marks around her throat hours after the incident, and, and that wasn't enough for her to win. Now, why wasn't it enough for her to win? The judge looked at the technical uh, description of strangulation in the it, then in the criminal law and in the, in the dictionary, and he said, well, uh, strangulation, the definition of strangulation and being strangled is uh, forcibly being sort of grabbed around the throat with the intention to kill. And so the ruling from this judge, Mr. Justice Mitting, and Mr. is, uh, you know, just to indicate it was a, an old white male judge, 
uh, found that his intention was to silence her, not to kill her, and so found that even with the evidence from the police that he had forcibly grabbed her around the throat, uh, Nicola Stocker lost her defamation case. Now, that caused a huge controversy at the time. There was, uh, you know, headlines in the British press from women's uh, legal services and from domestic violence charities saying this is a red light to ab abusers. We all know that strangulation is a is a is an indication of potential escalation of domestic violence in the home as well. So, and of course, there's been a big debate about the definition of strangulation, which has now changed to remove the intention requirement. So it's sufficient to be forcibly grabbed around the throat. Um, in any event, that went to the appeal courts and we intervened. And we said in our intervention, it, it ended up in the Supreme Court. Uh, we said in the intervention, you can't look at, as I said earlier, this reputation and speech in isolation, you've got to look at women's ability to be able to speak about their experiences, the public interest in women being able to speak out, the right to live free from um, violence, the right to equality. Um, all of these rights play into the spectrum. And so the, the courts ought to be looking at this, which tips the balance in favour of women's speech. And the Supreme Court refused to hear us. So we tried to intervene on behalf of Liberty. She and Nicola Stocker ended up winning, but only seven years after she'd been sued, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of uh, costs against her, and not including the damages that she had been ordered to pay him. Um, and this is a man who had like repeatedly violated apprehended violence orders, so AVOs or whatever you would call them in other jurisdictions for those of you from different jurisdictions, but basically a domestic violence restraining order. Um, and he'd been had gun offences, I mean, and had forcibly grabbed her around the throat. And yet that was not enough for a judge to find that he was a dangerous man and to any woman that he lived with. So it's just, it was an astonishing decision. Happily, it was overturned. And I'm pleased to say that the, so we decided to write the book and we say in the, in the, in the beginning of the book, so here are all the arguments that we would have made before the Supreme Court in this country had they heard us. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the Colombian Constitutional Court has recently, uh, as the book went to print, um, issued a decision which set out everything that we'd written in the book and said we were right, basically. So we're starting to see cases, courts around the world, pick up these arguments and to protect, better protect women's free speech. And I think hopefully we'll see more and more of that because we do see, you know, as these decisions reach sort of constitutional courts and you've got the UN talking about it and writing about it, that will start to influence other courts in different jurisdictions, I think. And But we need more advocates making these points. So we haven't seen that these arguments be run in, in the UK yet, but I hope we will soon. Yeah, it's great to hear that there's some more positive decisions um, occurring out there and that hopefully that momentum will kind of continue on. I think especially when you're working on these kind of issues, you definitely have to hold on to that. that I know, hope. The irony of a judge saying he didn't intend to kill her, he intended to silence her, mm -hmm. and by mate reaching that judgment, silence Nicola from being able to speak about her her experience of violence. So it's like the law was being weaponized to silence her. So what he didn't achieve by strangling her to death, he achieved through the law. And um, yeah, so seven years of Nicola Stocker's life to be able to defend her truth. Yeah, it's um, both unfortunate and ironic. And I know another um, kind of moment of, of irony with the book is the kind of large disclaimer and the many pages of redactions that you had to include, um, I guess, as your own kind of experience of being silenced. And I will actually hold up to kind of show you what I'm talking about for those of you who don't have a um, physical copy of the book to just show you how striking some of these redactions are that um, had to be made to the book in order to kind of minimise um, some of the, the legal risks and the silencing that you know, you're actually writing about. And what was that experience <laughs> like? I have to say this book was a nightmare to write. And because Kane and I are both media defence barristers, so we are very accustomed to legaling work. So we were we were almost legaling our work as we were going along, but we were writing about all of these men who are notoriously litigious and we're writing about the very subject matter that they had already sued on. Um, and often about cases that were in progress. So we were constantly having to update where the case was at because, as as you all know, the law moves slowly. So we might have got a trial decision, but it had gone to appeal. And by the time the book came out, the appeal courts had decided. Um, also in 
in the reason we've got the big reduction that you just saw Maisie hold up, one of the, the ideas we had was we thought, well, let's write the book. And then once it's legal, because even though we're media defense lawyers and we find it hard to write about this and we're experts, we still had to have someone legal it for us. So read our work and provide independent legal advice on what we'd written. And we thought, I said, I want to, re- I don't want to remove anything because what you guys don't see is what we see when we legal something is the stuff that's removed. And so we wanted to actually redact the book where we had to remove things for legal reasons. As it turns out, we we are media defense lawyers, so there was very few changes that had to happen because we were so diligent in the way we wrote, uh, which is what made the book so difficult. But we were also reporting on ongoing police investigations and criminal prosecutions. And one in particular uh, caused us legal headaches was the um, was the case involving Bruce Lerman down in Australia, um, Brittany Higgins, Uh, spoke out about um, her experience of being, uh, what she says was her experience of being raped in the Minister for Defence's office in Australia's parliament. It caused a huge controversy in Australia. It sparked the March for Justice protests. And uh, she spoke out, after she spoke out, caused a huge controversy. Um, He was investigated and ultimately charged with having raped her that case was progressing through the courts and was due to go to trial before our book was published. And unfortunately, because of public comments that were made by journalists in Australia, uh, the trial had to be postponed for contempt reasons to protect his right to innocent because there'd been a bunch of reporting that hadn't properly recognised that the case was still being determined and um, had indicated his, well, had made comments that could impute guilt. And so the trial was postponed and so our book was due to come out after the trial it we ended up our book coming out in australia smack bang in the middle of the criminal trial and the judge made very strong comments saying no one is to discuss this case all of these books that are due to come out you cannot reference this case you cannot talk about it and so a lot of books removed conversate the discussion of this case altogether from the book and i said absolutely not i'm not censoring her story and it's also so important to understand this story in the context of what we've been writing about we wrote a whole chapter about what happens when women speak out to show how often it takes one woman that sparks another and another and another that sparks a protest movement uh, to force change and better conditions for women and so we we had to tell that story. And Brittany's story was a really important part of what happened in Australia at that time in this po- post Me Too moment. And so I said, no, we're not going to remove it. We're going to redact it because I want people to see in a very visceral, direct way how the law prevents us from being able to talk about this. And so but there's big chunks of the book that have been redacted. Um, sadly for Brittany, the trial fell apart because of juror misconduct and the prosecution did not pursue the case because of concerns about her mental health and well-being. Uh, and since then, Bruce Lemon is now facing two more charges of rape in respect of a different complainant in Queensland. So the, that case shows really um, in a really striking way how the law and the law does impact our ability to talk about this. Now, I think that contempt decision was very broad and I think has had a massive chilling effect on discussion. The, the, the purpose of contempt laws is not to prevent us talking about these cases. We just can't say that a person is guilty until it's proven in court. And I think, you know, it doesn't, we should still be able to have widespread public discussion about a case, but it just goes to show how fraught these issues are and how important it is for women who want to speak out to get legal advice because it's a mind, it, it is genuinely a minefield. Mm. Yeah, I think reflecting on the Lerman case in particular and the the specific issues that come up for women um, speaking out about their experience during um, active ongoing trials, whether criminal or otherwise, we've got a very timely question from Nick Young, who's joined us, who's a uh, fellow uh, Rhodes Scholar in residence, who's interested to hear what you think about the live streaming of defamation trials. Um, for example, the Amber Heard case, and how courts should balance the desire for open justice and the potential risks to women in these cases. Nick, thank you for asking that question because that's one of the key concerns that we raise in the book, actually, because of my experience working with Amber Heard uh, and what we've just seen happen in the Brittany Higgins, um, in, in the case of Brittany Higgins and Bruce Lerman's defamation case in Sydney in the federal court. So um, open justice is 
Absolutely important. And in a criminal context, you have a right to an open trial, of course, but in a criminal trial, we've developed all of these mechanisms to protect complainants. Uh, for example, complainants don't have to give evidence in open court. They also can have special measures which um, protects them from even having to give evidence in front of the perpetrator. Uh, we don't have any of that in the civil justice context. Now, also in criminal trials, you would never live broadcast the testimony of a complainant on sexual violence. Not even in the United States do they do that. Now, in our jurisdiction, it's very different. Criminal trials are not broadcast. We only have um, the broadcasting of criminal sentencing. Um, and in the defamation case brought by Johnny Depp against the son in this jurisdiction, we actually sought special measures for Amber so that she wouldn't have to give evidence of sexual violence in open court because you know, it, it was one for her, and that was to protect her privacy. So in this jurisdiction, it was not broadcast and her evidence was not even heard in open court. It was heard in front of Depp's counsel and the son's counsel and myself as her lawyer and the judge. So the evidence was tested, but it wasn't broadcast and the journalist could not report on the detail of it. And that that's an appropriate balance to be struck and we see it in criminal trials here, that's the appropriate balance to be struck between ensuring the evidence is properly tested so that the matter can be determined, whether it's in a criminal case or in a defamation context, but protecting the complainant from having to give that evidence in, in public. Now, when the decision was taken to broadcast the defamation trial in the US, I was shocked and I was even the judge said at the time, well, we'll have special measures in place. We'll have, we'll, we'll, this will be handled. There was no handling of it. Amber was forced to give evidence live online of, of sexual assault. Um, that was chopped up and spread all over social media, uh, including horrific, um, horrific TikTok videos of women saying they wish Johnny had done it to them. And I mean, some of it's been so disturbing to see that play out online. And I thought that will never happen again because it was so horrific and everybody recognises it was horrific and she should never have had to do that um, and how traumatic that was for her. And yet then we have the Lemon defamation case down in Australia and the judge orders that, she, that Brittany Higgins gives evidence. And I watched that evidence and I was online watching it and there were 17,000 people online watching her give evidence of rape. Now, of her alleged rape, of course, it's still before the defamation courts and, and Bruce Lemon still um, insists that it didn't happen. Um, so I am really concerned about that. Now, of course, there's particular contempt laws in Australia that, that protected that live stream. So you can be prosecuted for sharing any images. And, and in fact, somebody is being prosecuted for having shared material from that live stream. There's no such restriction in the United States. But even still, for Brittany to, to be required to give evidence in that way, I think was wrong. And you can you, the court could have protected the open justice by allowing it to be broadcast. And I think it's great it was broadcast, also because we get to see the, um, the male-centric myths that counsel use in cross-examining a woman in that context. So I'm glad that we got to see a lot of a lot of that testimony. But there could have been special protections for her so she didn't have to online of, of the rape itself and I think I think we need to to the extent that judges are not issuing the discretion they have to grant special measures to complainants in civil trials we ought to be advocating for and lobbying for um, new legislation to protect women from if that ever happening again and that's certainly something like one of the things Amber heard and I talk about a lot is law reform to that end to protect anyone from having to go through what she went through because it was horrific Mm. Continuing the reflection on um, judges exercising their their discretion in these cases, we've got a question that, um, given that uh, jury trials for defamation have been abolished in the UK and are increasingly rare in Australia, mm -hmm. especially as social sentiment changes, um, hopefully for for the better, um, do you think jury trials could perhaps be of assistance? to women in this context or bringing in more diverse perspectives and social norms into the courtroom? I think it cuts both ways. It's an interesting perspective because typically we would say it cuts the other way uh, in the sense that there's a huge amount of research that shows that juries are absolutely affected by um, male-centric myths about gender-based violence. And I quote some of them in the book. 
And I felt it was important for me to look at that because I was so disappointed by watching the Depp v. Heard case play out in the United States in Virginia after having won the case in this jurisdiction where the judge found that she had suffered violence on 12 separate occasions, um, including separate findings about sexual violence. Um, sorry, not including se separate findings about sexual violence. Um, then to see it play out so differently in front of the jury and again, this is a question. So there's demonstrated evidence that jurors are affected by this. And in criminal trials, again, we have a protection, which is judges are required to give a direction to juries that that warns them about those malcentric myths, warns them about myths about real victims, who's a real victim, who's not a real victim, what's how a victim ought to behave or not behave. And there was no such protection. And there is no such protection in jury trials. And there was no protection in Amber's case. There was no such warning given to the jurors. And of course, we saw all those male-centric stereotypes play out. And even the jurors' comments afterwards that have since been reported saying that she didn't, Amber didn't cry in the right way. Um, so they didn't believe her because she didn't cry right. And it's like, again, it's like real victim kind of assessments of women and how they present to be believed. Um, are so problematic in the context of juries. So maybe in time to come, you're right, that maybe societal views will change, we'll have better better education about these issues. But frankly, after seeing what happened in the DEP trial, I would never want a woman to go on, on allegations of this nature to go before a jury. I'd much prefer it to be before a judge who's been educated against these myths and stereotypes. And frankly, I mean, I hope that you're right, um, I'm sorry, I don't know who asked the question. I'd reference your name if I if I had it. I hope that you're correct that, you know, attitudes are changing. But my experience, having seen what just happened with the Depp and Heard um, case, is it was demoralising to see um, how far we still have to go. I thought we were further ahead than we are. And so I think there's a huge education piece that needs to happen around how we understand gender-based violence and how we assess um, how we assess evidence in these cases. Mm. You've spoken a lot about the um, harms um, to Amber Heard from the Depp trial and how those were exacerbated through the live streaming and also perhaps through th the role of the jury in the US case in particular. But as you speak about in the book and as I know is ongoing um, for you even in the last kind of 24, 48 hours. Um, we've got a pre-submitted question that's asking about um, the, the types of harassment um, and um, comments and, and abuse that you experienced um, being involved in the case and representing Amber in court. Uh, yeah, I mean, the online trolling and attacks that Amber has faced and that I have faced as her lawyer are appalling. And what I have faced pales into significance, is like a tiny, tiny percentage of what she's faced. And in fact, there's just been a, um, a Tortoise Media just did a, a podcast series, which is which is out or is accessible or partly accessible and is coming out over the next few weeks. It's accessible to subscribers, um, which is Who Trolled Amber?, because I've never in my career seen um, an online onslaught, which is the only way I can describe it, towards a client uh, that I saw against Amber. It was it was huge. And the studies since done show that it's uh, mainly um, inauthentic activity. So someone has generated um, this huge amount of online activity attacking her and undermining her credibility and, you know, justice for Johnny, she's a liar, she's an abuser, she's a gold digger, um, none of which is borne out by the facts and that, that's what the judge found in this in this country. Um, and yet it doesn't matter because it's just said so much online, people start to believe it and it does affect people's views. But the online attacks have been horrendous. So, I mean, I've got death and rape threats. Um, Amber has death and rape threats towards her and her daughter, her little girl. Um, I've had messages saying you've got a punchable face like Amber heard, um, all kinds of things. And I, I mean, and it started again because there's, because I just gave an interview for this podcast, um, that was investigating the trolling against Amber, which sort of showed that it looks like it could have been, um, state directed, uh, or partly state directed, um, 
you know, there is any time there's a spike of activity around the case, I get trolled. My Twitter timeline is just filled with people um, attacking me, attacking my professionalism, attacking my ethics, attacking how I look, attacking my personal life, all kinds of things. And and I think this is a sad reality of women who are in the public sphere and have a profile and who dare to put their head above the parapet. And again, this is about women's public participation. So you see politicians cop it, in, they get it the worst. And in fact, we've got a number of MPs in this country right now who have bodyguards at the moment because of the, the vitriol against them. I represented um, the family of Daphne Caruana Galizia, the journalist who was killed in a car bomb in, in Malta. And the online vitriol directed to her, which ultimately the the sort of the demonization of her and this online discussion, which then was on a spectrum of violence that ultimately led to her death, um, we have to understand it in this context. And so we start to talk about, we're starting to talk for journalists, women journalists get it terribly as well. So in that context, uh, we talk about it being an occupational health and safety risk for women who are journalists. Um, I certainly think it is for me as a lawyer and I try not to engage with it. People say, oh, don't engage with it. And I say, well, it's impossible. I don't engage with it. I don't respond. Um, but it's impossible. not. You either come offline or you see it. You can't help but see it. And it's and it's so unpleasant. Um, it really, I think, but I'm not going to be sad. What they want is me, for me to shut up and I'm not going to shut up. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, a lot of women do. So you see women come out of online spaces or come off Twitter or come off Instagram or stop being as sort of present and um, out there with their views because they'll get attacked. And, and so we have to start to grapple with this as a problem in our society because it is affecting women's ability to participate in in the public sphere. And and it's, yeah, we sh none, none of us should have to <laughs> deal with that kind of stuff. Mm, yeah, it's an, it's incredibly difficult and and upsetting. I think both on a kind of personal and professional and these these systematic levels. And I think, um, in as we kind of approach the end of our conversation, I'd like to end perhaps on a more optimistic note and ask you when you're dealing with that kind of vitriol online and engaging with these cases or or writing books about these, um, are frankly quite quite upsetting manifestations of of gender violence and feeling like you're kind of pushing up against this this whole system um a patriarchal system and trying to shift it how do you kind of find um the hope and energy and inspiration to continue to do that very important work the great question one of the best things about working on this book and doing this book was meeting these incredible women around the world who have had, many of them have had really horrific experiences, but have turned turned their experiences into campaigns and pushback that's changing things for other women. And I've been so inspired by that. So while, you know, yes, we are working within a patriarchal structure, yes, we're working within a legal system which often oppresses um, women and silences women and marginalised communities, um, but within that, there's so many, and what I learned through this process and the interviews we did around the world and through speaking with a lot of um, brilliant women is there's really innovative, interesting campaigns going on around the world to push back on rape culture, to push back on domestic violence culture, to push back on silencing, to push back on perpetrators who are weaponizing the law. And so we do write about that and sort of inspiring examples of women who have really taken on the system. So just to give you a couple of examples that I love. So Zelda Perkins, who spoke out about Harvey Weinstein, uh, she started a campaign, Can't Buy My Silence, which is really shifting the way the fact she spoke out and revealed the use of these contractual tools, um, which we write about in the book in detail, uh, that are keeping women in silos of silence and contracting them to silence. The fact that she revealed hers and took the step of speaking out um, at risk of being sued or injuncted, uh, she, you know, has changed the way we talk about NDAs. And so NDAs, NDAs, which were once a tool of reputation management, you're now, it's actually, if you enter an NDA, the fact of entering it is a problem, is actually becoming a reputational risk rather than a reputation management tool. And so I think she's done great work. And then people like Chanel Contos down in Australia with Teachers Consent, um, the strategy, the innovative strategies she used around anonymous reporting of stories, which gets around so many of the legal risks um, at play 
which makes it less about any individual complainant or perpetrator, which always becomes a story about those individuals and attacking the credibility of those individuals. It, it, it sort of surfaced this, and, and so Ms. Sarah here in this country who, who ran a similar campaign to Chanel's, uh, everyone's invited, that just was able to sur- get around legal risk and also surface the culture and sort of demonstrate the culture in a really interesting way that sparked a lot of conversation. So I think there's so many exciting things happening around the world and there's so much pushback going on. And I think I really enjoy lifting up these women's stories and um, platforming them to sort of show, inspire, um, show hope and you know inspiration for others to take on these issues in their own jurisdiction and, and the sharing of strategies around the world of women. So this idea of countersuits I was interviewing a, a, one of India's um, key lawyers who represents a lot of women in these kinds of cases and I told her about you know what we're seeing more and more countersuits being filed and she was like what a great idea I'm going to start advising my clients to do it so you know there's there's lots of really positive things happening and I think we have to be positive and and uh, take it on because otherwise nothing will ever change. Absolutely thank you so much I think that kind of sentiment is wonderfully reflected in in the book as well, even though it's dealing with these kind of very heavy issues, the um, empowering stories of the women are are really elevated. And I know that through my experience of reading it, it sparked some really wonderful and interesting conversations among friends and and peers, which um, is really exciting. So for anyone who's listening. I love hearing that. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Right. <laughs> yeah. And so for anyone who's online who hasn't got a copy yet, I see that Georgie's posted a link um, in the chat where you can purchase a copy. Um, and I think on that note, um, I will wrap up the session. So thanks so much, Jen, for joining us and for sharing all your insights and experiences. And thanks so much to everyone for joining and your very insightful questions. It's been wonderful to have this time with you. And I hope you um, have all learned something and taken away some new knowledge about why we should um, pay attention to women's right to free speech and what we can all do to ensure it's protected. Thanks Thank very much. You. Thank you. And I'm I'm really delighted to be able to engage with the Rhodes community. So I, I encourage you all to, um, to reach out and be in touch as well. And um, one of the greatest things about this book is that the, the feedback we're getting from um, frontline services organizations and from survivors and journalists who have really found it useful. So I hope, I hope it is useful and I hope you enjoy the book is not the right word because it's a difficult book to read in some ways, but I hope it lights a fire. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jen. And I also see that um, for those of you who are interested in continuing to engage in the scholar community, as Jen just mentioned, there this is a recurring series um, with a range of scholars engaging um, in literature that they have written. And Georgie's also posted a link to the rest of the program um, if you have had a fire sparked and want some more. Great. Thanks, everyone.